Hello and welcome everyone to the next Foreman Community Demo. October already, the year is flying by. Your host, Gingilvan, here as always. Going to take you through another excellent show today. We've got quite a lot to talk about. So, uh, wait a minute, I'm getting feed feedback. No. So, what we're going to have is we're going to have some demo content. We're going to have some Catello stuff. We're going to have some event stuff. We are going to have all sorts of useful things. And in a minute, I'm going to find the window that is giving me so much sound. There we go. My goodness, what a terrible, terrible way to start a broadcast. OK, so cracking straight along. As you may have heard, 1.13 is out. If you haven't, you're hiding under a rock somewhere. But anyway, well, if you're watching this and you haven't heard it somewhere else, I'll be quite impressed. And you need to come and talk to me. We're going to have Catella stuff. We're going to have some Open SCAP Hammer stuff. We're going to have an update uh, on uh, one of the, uh, the core pages that's not had uh, a lot of love in a long time. 113, if you haven't heard, IPv6 support, big headline news, UEFI and TFTP updates, um, performance in the proxy, structured facts for Puppet, OpenStack updates, so much stuff in there. Also, very much latest breaking news, Catello 3.2 RC2 is out um, about two hours ago, I think. So that's hot off the presses. As always, your testing is hugely valued, um, and it does look like... Uh, uh, that's going to be pretty solid. Uh, the Puppet 4 support coming in uh, for Catello 3.2 there needs your help, so please do go and check it out. I'm going to talk for a moment about events. Um, so um, we've got a, a bunch of upcoming events. So Puppet Conf is next week. If uh, if you're going to Puppet Conf, it's a bit late to register for tickets, to be honest. I'm sorry about that. I didn't tell you. But uh, if you are going to Puppet Conf and uh, you want to talk Foreman with people, uh, we've got a couple of things going on. Uh, we don't have a Foreman booth at Puppet Conf, to my knowledge. Um, and it'd be bad if we did, because no one told me. But we do have a Red Hat booth there. There will be Foreman people there. Uh, please do go along uh, and come and chat with us if you want to talk Foreman Puppet stuff. We're also trying to set up a small Foreman event for uh, probably the Wednesday evening. If you are interested in that, there is a thread on the Foreman users mailing list and uh, we're putting together um just maybe go for some drinks or something one evening maybe a bit of food so if you're interested in any of that check out the mailing list slightly further out we have config management camp berlin and also devops days berlin in november i think that's november the 15th uh, there are foreman talks on the schedule um netways are going to be giving a talk about uh, about foreman and i think cern are doing a talk which doesn't mention foreman by name but i believe they do use foreman so it might come up Further out still, if you're looking for things to register for or possibly even to submit talks for, there is DevConf, uh, Czech Republic, and FOSDEM and Config Management Account Ghent, as always. Uh, CFP is open for DevConf. I believe the CFPs for FOSDEM and Ghent will be out in a while, and I will post those to the mailing list, of course. All of these links will go in the show notes if people want to check them out, register, submit talks, whatever. Speaking of events, um, we did also have Ansible Fest just a couple of days ago, and we had one of our team there. Uh, so I'm just going to hand over to Andrew for a minute, who can uh, tell us a little bit about what he what he got up to at Ansible Fest. Uh, thanks, Greg. Yeah, so Ansible Fest was in Brooklyn this year. Uh, it was October 11th. They had about 620 people uh, show up. It was the largest showing thus far for Ansible Fest. Um, key things, one of the big announcements is now open source. So you can go download that and yourself have your own Galaxy um, inside if you want. Another thing that they talked about was Python 3 support. They're expecting that in 8.4. They're in 2.2 just now. And when they do that, they're going to be job support for Python 2.6 and, and below, or below 2.6. So I was able to uh, talk to a lot of people about Foreman for DevOps, specifically uh, setting up current, and also, of course, how uh, Foreman supports Ansible. So that was really great. And uh, I think I work with a lot of people and, in fact, get a an opportunity to uh, talk on a podcast with Fever on Bag. So look for that in the coming weeks. 
Cool. Thanks for that. I think I think you've got a bit of uh, a line line issue there. You're breaking up a bit there, but I think we got the most of it. Sounds like lots of cool stuff going on. Moving on, then we will have some updates from me as usual. So uh, the metrics, as I always do in these videos, things are pretty pretty interesting. Um, so with one thirteen out, quite a surge. In fact, a fifty percent increase in package downloads in the last month. Quite quite astonishing. Um, no idea where that's come from. I, as I always say with download metrics, they don't actually measure a lot, but the trends are vaguely interesting. Um, so good to see. Very happy about that, obviously. Slightly more interesting, plugins. Um, not much moves here, but um, slight improvements in popularity for Hooks and Salt, who have moved up in the list. And uh, an honorable mention to Form and Ansible uh, on, on topic with Andrew there, uh, which would have been the next line if I had room on the page. But um, yeah. Um, pretty pretty static in terms of trends here. Uh, the usual suspects are still very, very popular. Um, talking about bugs and patches, um, I don't think we expect to see very much here. As, uh, when you go through a release cycle, you get a spike uh, as everyone fixes bugs coming in from the release candidate testing. So unsurprisingly, on this time around, we see uh, a decrease because one third, you know, one, the last RC was pretty solid and didn't have a lot changing in it, and then we had the release. So Obviously, we see a number of bugs down against the last demo. Um, you also see, I'll show that on the next slide, the same thing in the PRs as well. What I do want to point out, and, and a huge, huge thank you to the community, um, we have 33% of bugs being raised by, um, I define the community as people not um, paid to work on form and by Red Hat, basically, because I'm interested to know, is the community self-supporting and is it growing? So, um, I have a way of calculating that, and this time it shows 33% uh, were coming from other sources. On, on absolute numbers, that's 8% up on last time, but when you think about it in terms of relative, that's gone from 25 to 33, that's a one third increase in one month. So might be an outlier. I'd like to see if it stays that high next demo, but right now I am very impressed with that. So thank you to everyone who goes out of their way to come and tell us what's wrong. Again, this could be attributed to the RC system where people go and test and report bugs, right? But nonetheless, it's it's massively valuable. So thank you very much. As I said, um, pull requests, much the same as the bugs. Uh, we see an overall general drop because I think things stabilize a little bit. People go and work on slightly bigger features at the start of the next release cycle, that kind of thing. Not too surprising. But you know, the key, key message, as always, plenty going on in the community at the moment. So um, I'm going to stop yattering away uh, because um, I talk enough as it is. So I'm going to hand over to our first presenter, which is David, and he's going to give us a whole bunch of Catella updates, I think. Yeah. So for this sprint, I worked on four features, which I'm going to demo. Uh, the first involves uh, pattern matching on the repository upload command from the CLI. Um, here I have a Puppet um, repository and some Puppet modules. Currently, I can only upload uh, by supplying a file name. Um, this is uploading a single file. Uh, if I want to upload multiple files, I have to specify a directory and it'll upload all files in the directory. Um, here it would upload all files in the modules directory. Uh, but now I've added um, block support. Um, so here I'm going to upload all files that start with Puppet and then with tar, GZ. Uh, one thing is you have to escape the um, blob, otherwise the shell tries to um, expand it, and it's impossible to support that with clamp right now. Uh, so one other thing is if I don't pass in, um, or if I pass in a glob that doesn't match any files, it tells me about that. Another feature I worked on was promoting content views into multiple environments. Uh, here's a content view. It has no environments. Uh, before on promote, um, you only have uh, an argument which allows you to promote to a single environment. Um, but now we have support 
of promoting it to multiple environments. Um, so I'm going to demo that. I'm going to promote it to three environments. Library, dev, and test. And the UI is still outstanding, which is why I'm demoing from the CLI. Um, but here you can see it runs a single task. And once that task is done, you'll see that the version has been promoted into three environments, library, dev, and test. Uh, next, I worked on package applicability. You might remember from the last sprint, um, Justin downloaded the API for this. Um, I worked on this, the UI and the CLI. And so first off, if I go to the packages page, you'll see that there are two new filter options, uh, applicable and upgradable. And just to refresh everybody's memory, uh, applicable means that the package is upgradable, um, but not necessarily directly available uh, to the client um, in the content view or environment. Upgradable means that the package is uh, available to the client. Um, here we have Walrus. It's applicable, but it's also upgradable. Um, and if I drill down into the package, I can actually see that it's applicable to one host. It's also upgradable for one host. If I click on one of these links, I can actually see the host. And there's the host. And I can actually look at this from the CLI too. Uh, so it's going to be the package list command, and there's two new options, one for applicable and then one for uh, upgradable. And again, you see here the walrus command or the walrus package. Uh, and then I can also look at a host and then see what packages or how many packages are upgradable or applicable. I look at the host. Here you can see for this host, it has one applicable and one upgradable package. And so that's pretty much it. Cool. Um, I have a quick question on that one. Um, you showed the applicable versus upgradable. Is that the same host in that in that particular instance? Are they, or is it like one host has it available, one host has it upgradable? So it's the same host. Upgradable is a subset of applicable. Um, if it's upgradable, then it's applicable as well. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Okay, um, I'm keeping an eye out. I always forget something on these demos, right? So I forgot to uh, mention to the people watching live, if you do have questions, you can get in touch with the show and, and ask them. You can hit us up on the Foreman IRC channel. That's Freenode hash the Foreman. There's also the YouTube live channel, which I am keeping half an eye on. And so if you're watching this on the YouTube page, you can ask questions there and I will relay them to the presenters. In the meantime, we will move forward, and we're going to have Justin up next, who's going to give us a bit more on package applicability and, and some publishing things as well. So, Justin. Thanks, Greg. Um, yes, continuing on from what David said, or was talking about with package applicability, uh, and this, this really helps you see what updates are available to your hosts, even if, for example, there's no errata in the repos, so your custom repos or uh, CentOS or things like that. Um, but we've added another icon in the installable updates. Um, I believe it used to be the errata column. Uh, but in addition to the three errata types, we now have a fourth uh, for the package count. So we can see here that there are 44 packages that are upgradable on this host. And if I click on that, it'll actually take me to a page where I can list um, all the upgradable packages for this host and uh, we can search and then from here I can just select a few of these and hit upgrade and uh, it will use Catello agent 
or if you're using Rex remote execution, it will also, it can also use Rex. Um, I don't have it installed here, but uh, otherwise you would see an option to do that. In addition, uh, you can actually search uh, by upgradable. Um, so we can search for all packages that can um, that you know, have this particular package as upgradable. In this case, I don't have any. Uh, but it really, I guess, sort of gives us more feature parity with applicable packages as well as uh, applicable errata. And uh, this actually does split up the packages tab for a content host into three pages, one for generic YUM actions, one to list installed packages, and one to list applicable packages. And also for applicability, uh, there was a request. Um, right now, the errata status is calculated based on the errata that is uh, applicable to the host, but not necessarily what is in that host's content view. So if I've eliminated errata from my host content view, the uh, errata status will actually show uh, what's based off library. So if I've eliminated some security errata that I don't want to apply, the errata status will still show red that those are available. But we've now added an option to restrict the status to only what is installable. Um, and so this allows, this allows you to opt in to have the status only show you the things that you actually maybe care about. So I've flipped that setting to yes, and now if we refresh, uh, you see the status change to green. And so it actually recalculates that status uh, when I change the setting. And moving over to a, a content view feature, uh, as part of, I believe it was 2.1 or something around there, Catello 2.1, uh, we actually changed Catello so that it would no longer publish empty Puppet environments. And the reason for that is that uh, it mucks up your environment listings. Uh, if you have more than like 200, it will puppet, the Puppet Master will fail to start. Lots of problems with that. So we stopped publishing empty Puppet environments uh, for, for lots of good reasons. There were some cases where a user actually wanted those empty Puppet environments. And typically that was for setting up some staging content views uh, that maybe don't have Puppet modules now, but we'll have them in the future. So we've added the setting to force puppet environment creation. It defaults to no, but we can then uh, we can mark it as yes. And then when we publish this content view, it will publish a puppet environment for each lifecycle environment, even if there's no puppet modules in it. And those are all my features. Um, I did also want to highlight some RFCs on the RFC uh, GitHub repo. If you're not familiar with this, this is the place where we basically write uh, up feature designs and change proposals to be reviewed by the community, by developers, by any, anyone that's really interested in what is being discussed. And I wanted to highlight specifically a whole bunch of RFCs that uh, Eric Helms has been working on about making Catello a more First class plugin to Foreman. And there's a variety here, such as um, getting our ports in a consistent state that the different services use, getting the administration scripts in a more consistent state, uh, merging the puppet modules and the installer uh, between Catello and Foreman, renaming and converting the capsule concept to just a pure smart proxy concept as well as uh, unifying the packaging and websites and documentation, uh, or sorry, uh, and documentation. So there's a lot of stuff here for interesting in Catello or might be interesting in Catello um, to just read through, or there, there's lots of other RFCs that have been up here as well. Um, so if you have some time and wanna give some feedback, it's always helpful. And with that, I'll hand it back to Greg, thanks. Thanks, Justin. Um, I do have one question uh, from from Maxim, who was uh, uh, wondering if the package count that you showed there. Just, I, I think he's talking about the the little icon in the summary. Is that including errata? 
Um, the let's see, let me get back to it. Oh wait. Uh, yes, on this page. Um, you're, not, you're not screen sharing at the moment. Oh, sorry. Uh, the package counts. Is that better? Yes. Yeah, the package count here, this 44, um, is including packages that are in errata. So, for example, these 17 errata um, include maybe all 44 of these packages, or maybe they only include 20 of these packages. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll, echo, I'll add uh, my weight to the RFC's repo. It's uh, it's really, really interesting place to go and have a browse if you're interested in the direction of the project or you want to suggest uh, larger features. Obviously, we also have patches and bug trackers and things, but in, in particular, things that possibly will involve orchestrating changes to multiple places in the code base. It's a great place to go and have larger discussions. So do go and check that out. Okay, uh, we'll move on. Uh, it's uh, back to Andrew again now. He's going to tell us a bit more about content view stuff. All right. So um, let me just share my screen. All right. So uh, can you see this? I have a uh, content view here. And it has, uh, it's already got a filter on it. And these are the two packages that are included. And you can see it's the same package with two different architectures. So if we just go to uh, the filter, you can now see a new column here called architecture. And if we edit our filter, you can now specify a specific architecture save and republish. And while this is publishing, I want to go ahead and show you that this is actually uh, not yet merged into upstream. There is a pull request. It's number 6367 on Catello. So just a fair warning that this is not yet in upstream. All right. You can see that the last version, version 9.0, had two packages, the ones that I showed you. And version 10 should only have one package here. And it will be the only the x86-64 version of Ruby Gem Atomic. So that's architecture support in content view filters. And uh, that's, that's it. Double click my microphone, good. Uh, thanks for that, Andrew. Um, we'll keep an eye out for questions on that. I'll just have a quick look, but so far I'm not seeing anything for you. So we are gonna move on. And next up, it's going to be Brad, and he's gonna give us some stuff on uh, sharing repositories in uh, CCVs. Okay, thank you, Craig. Um, so what I wanted to share is an update or enhancement that we've made to composite content views based upon feedback uh, that we've received from uh, users over time as, as folks have been ut utilizing them. Um, so in this particular one, it's the ability to share uh, component views or include multiple component content views in a composite that utilize the same source repo. Um, so just a little bit of background for those folks that uh, if not, if, familiar with composite content views, they basically allow a user to create a content view uh, that's comprised of several published content views. So if you created a content view for your application, one for your database, uh, one for your base OS, uh, you could then create a composite that uh, combines those three things into one and then utilize it. Uh, now, before the change uh, that I'm gonna show, uh, you could not include um, you know, two components that were comprised of the same uh, repository source. Uh, so for an example would be like CentOS 7 RPMs. Um, the reason that was difficult for many users was that a user may actually be creating a, a database view that's using the CentOS, um, you know, repo uh, that only has a subset of those, those RPMs uh, from the repo. And they might create a, a web server uh, view uh, that includes only a subset of the RPMs as well. And that, that constraint made it to where they could not do uh, that level of, of breakdown in their component views. 
Uh, so what I want to show is I'll, I'll just um, illustrate here. I have a, several comp com I'm sorry, several content views that I'm showing. I'm going to work with these errata. Uh, I'm sorry, these zoo errata um, views as well as zoo packages uh, views. These are ones that are are basically component views. You can tell by them saying they're not a composite. Uh, if I were to look at one of these, uh, they're all constructed in a similar manner. Uh, if I look at the repositories, I'll see it has the zoo repository in it. Uh, if I look at filters, each one of these has a filter that constrains the content that is going to be published uh, in this uh, content view. In this case, I'm constraining it to only include uh, one errata. So the zoo one, zoo errata one uh, component view, basically once published results in a, a repository or a content view with just one package, one errata. Now each of these components is, is similar in nature. Um, each one contains one errata and then there's one component that has a whole bunch of packages that have no errata. And basically the combination of those uh, results in a, a single composite view that will, will contain um, all of the content of that repository. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand create a composite. Once I've created my composite, I, I basically go in and I select the component views that I want to add to it. In this case, I'm going to construct this composite of all five of those uh, component views. And all of these are uh, sharing the uh, zoo repo. Now, prior to this change, what the user would get would be a validation error saying, no, you're not allowed to do that. We did not. So I'm going to go ahead and publish the content view now. Now, the end result of this particular composite publish should be a, a content view that consists of 32 RPMs and four rata. And the reason is that is what is contained within um, all of these um, content views. And this will take just a moment. And part of the reason that in the past we did not do this is that when this component or composite view is, is published, uh, the resultant repository um, is one. There's only one repository for a given source repo. So like in the case of, say, CentOS, if I had a component or you know two components that had the CentOS repo, we didn't allow that because at the end, when we publish the composite, you can really only have one CentOS 7 repo. Um, so the real change here is to be able to to generate or create that single uh, repository. Oh, and actually, I got a failure. OK. Well, let's go to the one that I did just a little bit before. I will debug that error offline. But this is a case where I did the exact same thing. I have my set of uh, zoo components. I published that to version 3. It resulted in 32 packages for errata. If I look at that, I should see that there is one YUM repository called Zoo, and then it had the 32 packages, and then it had four errata. So again, the reason we didn't support that in the past was you really can only have one ending uh, repository for, say, Zoo once that composite uh, view is, is published. And I will debug that error offline. Um, any questions? I will just have a look. I do like a man who's prepared and uh, and ready for any possible failures in their <laughs> demos. I don't just see any questions uh, from anybody else. Just just for my interest, where, where you had the name Zoo as the actual repo underlying and holding all of this. Where did that name come from? Did you specify that somewhere and I missed it? Yeah. So basically, when we um, synced the, or when I created a custom product and repository. Um, and I used a, a common uh, just test repository that we have called Zoo. Right. And I, I did that just because it's very small. Uh, so this is the repository that I created and synced in. So, so it comes from the product. Got it. Correct. OK, that makes sense. Uh, it's a sensible choice. Cool. OK, well, hang around. I'll, I'll keep an eye out for further questions. Oh, hang on. We do have another question. Um, so um, one question that's coming is, what, what happens if two of your component uh, of, your, of your composite view contain the same package? Does it resolve that? Yes, it's just going to take that one package. It's going to merge them together. What about, uh, how is it detecting that? Is it by, by checksum? Well, it's, it's using it based on, it's doing it based upon how the um, re RPM is within pulp. So we basically copy over all the pulp units uh, right, associated with right. each of the components that comprise that RPM, um, meaning so, it's 
So presumably you can't get into a state where you have two packages with the same name, but actually have like different sizes or checksums or whatever. It should not, no. Yeah. No, it's all controlled by pulp underneath, and we're just pulling in the units that were specified by the metadata. Cool. Okay. Right. Well, moving on then. I think I think that's all the questions. Just have a quick look around. So many windows to keep track of. So that's everything from Brad. Next up, we're going to have, I think it's Andre next. Andre? Andrew? Is it Andrew? You, you'll tell me in a minute, I'm sure. Um, but we're going to have uh, some CLI stuff now. So over to you. Hi. Uh, today, I'll be showing a new Hammer plugin that basically adds um, commands for Foreman OpenScap. I hope the font is big enough. If not, if not, let me just increase it and give me a shout. Yeah, and just maybe one one step maybe. up. One step up. Um, or, well, if it's easy, otherwise don't bother. Okay. It's probably, yeah, there you go. That's fine. Okay. So basically what you can now do is... Um, basically, uh, list your commands uh, which manipulate uh, compliance reports. Uh, same goes for uh, content. And and there are policies as well. Uh, of course, it's policy, not policies. Okay, and if you are, let's say, to create a policy, uh, you just add uh, all that's necessary to create a policy, and you will be able to see your policy in a second. That's about it. Super. Thank you very much. Uh, a welcome update for, for SCAP users. Is that that's a brand new plugin for Hammer? Um, yeah, right? it's, it's pretty new. Cool. So for all those SCAP users out there, you have new tools to play with. Go download. OK, so I don't see any questions for you just now. So hang around, and we will come back to you if necessary. In the meantime, I think we're going to move on to our last presenter. So, uh, Gail, first time, I think, for you on the demo. Welcome. Um, uh, it's good to have you. And I think you've been doing a bit of work on our charting libraries, right? That's right. Um, there's What I want to show you is the statistics page, which we've rewritten. Um, it looks more or less the same, but we've changed the infrastructure. Um, we're using more modern JavaScript charting library. It's consistent with Patternfly. The old charting library um, had, a, you know, less advanced technology and wasn't well maintained. Uh, one of the things that's been going on on the front end side or the client end side. There have been a number of activities that started with um, adding package management for JavaScript software that was independent of the Ruby gems. And with that, we've tried to um, make JavaScript more of a first class citizen. So We've added the package management, and now we're using ES6 um, coding standards. We've added some linting, and we've added some testing. Um, and what I'm doing now, what I'm showing you now, is really kind of the first example of using all of these things together. The new technology that was added here is React.js, which is um, it's a framework for uh, displaying data or, or uh, synchronizing data with display on the client side. 
So there haven't been a lot of changes. I tried to make the page look more or less the same as the previous one. What you can see um, sticking out is that the colors are different. And this is we're using a C3 library, which uses SVG, which are more advanced um, vector graphics. And these are the pattern fly color palettes. Uh, another thing that's new, I think, is this new data, um, the no data available message. Whereas in the past, I think it was um, only, you know, an empty square. Um, also, what we're doing here, but it was, is, is we're using uh, Ajax to kind of load the, the page um, more quickly or asynchronously so that at least when one chart is ready, we can see that. Now, that already exists because OHAD had put it in um, in the old technology. Um, and what we're going to be doing going forward is we'll be rewriting all the charts in, in core to replace the software. The, at this point, the only thing that's been rewritten is what I'm showing you now on the statistics page. But now that the infrastructure is in, we should be able to move along more quickly. There's a side effect here, which is that um, there's a JavaScript file, charts.js, which has some charting helpers using the old charting software. And it was previously just available in the global namespace. And that's not the case anymore. I've taken care of the instances in, in core, but if there are any plugin authors that have plugins that use charting, I have to add a, a reference to the charts.js file in their view. Um, so that's kind of it. And hopefully, you know, we can continue and show you more changes starting with the charts. Um, going forward. Thank you. Uh, cool. Thanks very much, Gail. It's uh, definitely been a long road to, to get here with the with the JavaScript changes. Uh, so it's good yeah. to see some user facing stuff finally starting to, to land. Um, is it worth maybe refreshing the page? Does it do these all load at the same time pretty much? Or, or do you can you actually show that um, kind of asynchronous loading? When, yeah, just a second. We got the little spinner and nice, nice, cool. It's a little thing, but actually, um, if people watching think about this as applied to the dashboard, for example, where you've got quite a lot of different widgets that take different times to load, this is going to be a big quality of life improvement. Um, yeah, for that, and so. there's you know behind that, I'm not you know showing you code. There is a, a loader component, not just for the charts, but kind of anything. Uh, that needs to be loaded, which will have th three states to it. The first being the spinner, the second being the sort of resolve state, um, which is you know what you were waiting for, and third being a, a state where you can show an error message. Mm. And that's going to be across the board for, for all. Oh, nice. Nice. So you can use that for all sorts of things. I can definitely think of some places where that's going to be useful. Right. OK. Well, um, I'll just do a final check uh, for questions for all of our presenters. Um, yeah, I don't see anything else that's being asked. So I think it's time to wrap up. So I would like to thank all of our presenters today. It's been great to have you on. As always, you can follow us on Freenode. You can follow us on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter. Uh, if you like the video, please do click that button or subscribe to the channel. As always, it is very appreciated. Thank you for being an awesome community, as always. But for today, that is everything. Thanks for watching, and do take care.